Welcome to Hub Dialogues. I'm your host, Sean Spear, Editor-at-Large at The Hub. I'm honored to be joined by David Frum for another installment of our bi-weekly podcast and video series, From Dialogues. David, as viewers will know, is a staff writer at The Atlantic, the author of several books, and a highly coveted guest and commentator on various cable television programs. We're honored to provide him with a platform to share his insights and analysis on key issues concerning Canadian policy and politics. In today's episode, we're discussing some aspects of Russia's invasion of Ukraine that have gone underexplored, including the role of social media, the mixed response by American conservatives, and what this ex experience ought to mean for Canadian defense and security policy. David, thanks for joining me as always. So glad to be back with you. There are many angles from which uh, to discuss Russia's invasion in Ukraine and the questions that it raises. You've written extensively, for instance, on the West's use of financial sanctions to challenge and penalize Russia. But I thought it would be interesting to discuss the role of social media. I saw someone tweet recently that we're watching war play out in 4K for the first time. How do you think social media has influenced the war thus far? Um, this is not the first social media war. Um, this isn't even Ukraine's first social media war. The 2014 social media war was the 2014 war where Russia invaded Crimea um, and the eastern provinces of Ukraine. That was also social media war. Um, what I think is, is different this time is that this is the first time where the non-Russian side has had dominance in the social media campaign. We are, what we are used to is Russia dominating the social media space, whether it is in the vaccine debate, whether it is with the uh, anti-Hillary Clinton pro Donald Trump argument, Russia, the, the side that has drawn support and reinforcement and sometimes ideas, inspiration, and even talking points from uh, the Russian troll factories, they have tended to prevail. This time that's not happening. A caution to everybody in a social media struggle like this, Everyone with an internet connection is both a combatant and also the battlefield. And uh, you need to be very aware of those two facts and be responsible for them. There is a lot of disinformation that is coming also from the Ukrainian side in this war. And you need to be very careful how you respond to that. And I think one other element of this is we all need to be conscious of, of human dignity. Um, do not share images of dead bodies. And um, and while you're not bound by the Geneva Conventions that prohibit the showing of images of, of captured soldiers, do so responsibly, sensitively, and compassionately. Um, this, is, this is a war in which there are so many victims on, on both sides, and the Russian conscripts who are fighting this war, um, they, they're, not, they're not demons, and they shouldn't be demonized. Well, let me pick you up on, on, let me pick up on a point you made. If, if the social media war is a war within the war, why do you think Russia is losing it so badly? That is a fascinating question, and I won't pretend to know. Uh, there, uh, as I write about this, I'm very conscious of things I can write about and, th and things I can't. So um, periodically you'll get a content questions like, what are Vladimir Putin's intentions? I don't know. Your guess is as good as, <laughs> as mine. So I don't really know why uh, the Russian campaign is going so badly. I, I can hazard guesses. I think the important fact is just to observe that it is. Um, and contrast that with um, the, the dominance that they've had in other similar kinds of struggles. And, and this really is different. Um, and maybe it's the global moral revulsion. Uh, maybe it's the lack of preparedness on the Russian side. Uh, but we can just remark that, um, that the pro-Ukrainian, pro-West side has, has really achieved um, dominance. And that means that it is also liable to some of the temptations to uh, misbehave that are part of this, which is the sharing of false information, the repackaging of videos taken in one place and making them seem as if they apply in another. So just everyone needs to be really careful about that. That The values that um, are on the table here, the values that the Ukrainians are struggling for on our behalf include values of truth, and we all need to be committed to those. And well, the projection of these powerful images and videos from Ukraine have clearly moved people in the West and, and no doubt influence um, the, the shift in, in policy position amongst European countries and even um, in, in North America. Is there a risk that we overcorrect from our, our previous policy of neglect? We've seen in recent days, um, you know, hockey leagues in Canada uh, blocking um, yeah. draft picks from Russia and Belarus. I saw today the International Cat F Federation is blocking cats from Russia and Belarus. Is there a risk that the, the social media nature of this conflict 
leads to a kind of overcorrection um, for those of us who are watching it from afar. That's such a good point. We, we don't need a BDS against Russia. Uh, we're, we, the, the target here really is the Russian state. Um, the Russian state knows that the Russian people are not on board for this war. That's why it has been so secretive. That's why it's lied about its amb mm -hmm. um, ambitions. And um, the, the, the goal that we hope for, I don't know that anyone, this is a war aim or anything like that, but the thing that we hope for is that Russia follows Ukraine into the community of nations. Um, and that someday maybe Russia too will be um, a normal market democracy with a relationship with the European Union. That, that's what we hope for. Um, and so... Uh, to, to make, um, there, the, there's one monster here and his henchmen and his beneficiaries and his profiteers. Um, but yeah, Russian cat owners, not the enemy. Um, what the, the, and the goal is to say, are you putting economic pressure on the regime while being careful to, not to do too much harm? I, I wrote um, at the beginning of the week about the power of central bank sanctions. And I warned that one of the dangers, of, one of the difficulties of these sanctions is they are actually too powerful. They could indeed collapse the Russian ruble into utter worthlessness, collapse the um, Russian economy and financial system into total dysfunction. Um, and, and that could, um, that, that may be more than anybody wants, and it could also backfire by radicalizing Russian opinion and giving them no choice but to follow their, their criminal leadership. So I think in all cases, I mean, we, if you're not on the battlefield, retain, please retain your humanity and please retain your understanding of the humanity of all people trapped in this totally unnecessary struggle that can have no winners. Uh, well said, David. Um, if I can pivot the conversation um, to the debate um, that Russia's invasion of Ukraine has inspired within American conservative politics yeah. um, in general and the Republican Party in particular, I I've been struck um, by cases of high profile conservatives, including Tucker Carlson, J.D. Vance and others, who've essentially argued that the U.S. has no interest in helping Ukraine. What's behind that? Is it a reaction to the perceived failures of Afghanistan and Iraq, or is it fealty to Donald Trump or something else? Well, first, I, it needs to be stressed that Republican elected officials, and especially those who are the leaders, have been completely solid um, on, on Ukraine. Um, the Senate majority, Senate leader Mitch McConnell and uh, House leader uh, Kevin McCarthy, the governors, the uh, that that there is no there, there is no pro Russia constituency among elected Republican officials of, of other than the absolute fringe weirdos. Um, what, so what you're perceiving is a divide between Republican elected officials and um, basically uh, these groups of people, um, people close to Donald Trump, um, people uh, on Fox News prime time, especially Tucker Carlson, but not only him, um, and uh, the candidates, the Senate candidates backed by Peter Thiel, not of whom J.D. Vance is the most prominent, but there, there are others. So it's, it's Trump, Tucker, and Thiel. Um, and that reflects, I think, a global divide in um, the conservative world. I mean, that uh, in, in Europe, too, there have been candidates of the right. Eric Zemmour was an outspoken advocate um, of, of Putin and Putinism. Um, what's what's going on here? I can't pretend to understand it exactly. I mean, the the question, the explanation of Donald Trump's infatuation with Putin and Russia remains an enduring mystery of his presidency. What mm -hmm. exactly drove that? Uh, because Trump stuck with it long beyond any point where um, it can be explained by just ordinary stubbornness or even ideology. There's something going on, and people have speculated about it. And, and I think a number of Republicans, in order, to, or a number of conservatives, in order to defend Trump, and in order to deal with this cloud of suspicion over his head, have, have followed his positions. Um, but I think there is something that, that happened in the 2010s, which is um, that a certain kind of conservative who would, in a different era, have been an ultra patriot to the United States, became so fed up with Americans' culture, its perceived decadence, its... Um, confusion about gender roles, it's, uh, irrelig it's irreligion, it's um, you know, uh, emphasis on ethnic and racial diversity. They became so disgusted with all of those things. They, just, they needed a new place to be patriotic to. And mm -hmm. they invented a Russia of the mind. Um, 
Now, it wasn't the real Russia. Real, real Russia is a less religious country than the United States. It has a much higher abortion rate than the United States. It has much higher levels of religious diversity than the United States. It has an enormous Muslim minority. Um, it's got um, tens of or millions, uh, more than 10 million illegal immigrants, uh, mostly from Central Asia, but some from other places too, Vietnam and Africa. Um, that uh, Russia is a big, multi-ethnic, multicultural, highly diverse, highly secular society. But they created this, this false image um, uh, that it became a replacement America. And what they, and the thing that they felt intuited and saw in Putin was that the only way they could get this thing that they, this kind of society they wanted for their own society was through brutal authoritarianism. Democratic means wouldn't take you there. Americans didn't want it. You couldn't win elections on this platform. And so this kind of social conservative um, jettisoned any vestigial attachment to democratic ideas, began to hanker for strongmen and found them first in Viktor Orban and then um, and then in Putin. But Putin is a strong man, not a strong, not really, but he he, act, he, he plays one on TV of a much stronger yes. state than Hungary is. So he's, there, 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 there always was a, a, a hunt for this kind of figure, but Putin really supplied the void. Um, just to follow up on, on, on that point, David, um, you, you wrote uh, this week, uh, a defense of free trade um, and the kind yeah. of liberal ideals that underpin it. Uh, how much of this is a re is a kind of overcorrection to legitimate concerns about the trends of globalization in, in the first couple of decades of this century, um, but steering the car far too much in the other yeah. direction in, in, in towards isolationism, protectionism, and and so on. And how do we get um, the American right? to sort of recommit itself um, to the ideals of, of internationalism? Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm going to take this as a little bit of a personal question because um, uh, I, I began writing a lot about the ha hazards and costs of globalization in the early 2000s. Um, and during the um, economic expansion of the early 2000s, from 2002 to 2007, one of the things that became apparent was um, that income gains were not being very widely shared in the United States, other developed countries too, but especially the United States. And it became, I, I think it was, there were policy reasons for this, but this was driven above, above all by the shock of China's arrival as a fully equal player on world markets. So the United States and China have uh, entered into normal trading relationships with each other in the year 2000. China adheres to the World Trade Organization about that same time. And the great Chinese export drive, which had been gathering force in the 1990s, just arrives as a a, a dramatic, overwhelming event. Now, the world had seen the arrival of these export superpowers before, um, when West Germany returned to world markets after World War II, Japan, um, the Asian Tigers. But um, those countries were, the Asian Tigers were small, and even Ger West Germany and Japan were medium-sized countries. Here's this gigantic country that is returning to world markets and exporting, and the impact is tremendous. So I was writing back in 2004 and five and six that, that developed countries and especially the United States need a response. Um, and the response I wanted was to find some way. I, I became a big advocate then of, of strengthening the U.S. social insurance network because I wanted to protect the free trade system, but I, uh, you had to compensate those people who, and we're not no longer just a few people, but lots of them who are being um, displaced if not literally in space, but certainly from their jobs and employment and their accustomed understanding of their role in the economic scheme of things, you needed to, to offer them a piece of the action. And if you couldn't do it through yes. um, the private economy, then it would have to come through social insurance. And during the Trump years, I, I would hear from a lot of Trump people who would say, well, you were one of the first people to write about this. Why don't you join Trump in his crusade against globalization? And I said, yeah, the, the reason I was so concerned about this in 2003 and four and five and six was just head it off. The, the, the goal here was to preserve the benefits of free trade, to preserve the liberal system in the face of this um, dramatic new fact of the rise of China. So where we are now um, is uh, China continues to rise, but at nothing like the pace uh, it was rising before. And there's a question of, of whether it, the Chinese economy, in fact, is really still growing or whether that's they're, they're lying through their statistics. Um, but we've had this shock. We've absorbed it. Now we have to... Um, recommit to uh, the, the free trade order. Now, that doesn't mean giving the Chinese everything they want. I'm a, I'm a big advocate of um, a carbon tariff that would apply not only to China, but to India as well. 
That is, we need to set a tax, we need to set a price on carbon in the developed world and uh, ideally, and then draw a border. And ideally, it's the biggest possible border. I mean, it would be fantastic. I know this is unrealistic. If you could have an agreed carbon price between the NAFTA zone and the EU and Britain and Japan and Australia and New Zealand, we could all agree on one price for carbon and then tax it domestically, trade freely amongst ourselves, and then have an exterior, a common wall. And I said, whatever the carbon price is inside the wall, that products from outside will be taxed um, on, on the, uh, by imputing that same price. But otherwise, otherwise we trade in freedom. Um, and that, that really needs to, to be the goal. Um, and when President Biden, the State of the Union, launched into this, uh, and he, he talked about, he, he said at one point, he began praising buy, buy American. He said, the law requiring the government to buy American has been on the books for almost 100 years, and it's usually ignored. But yeah, you know why? The, the reason it's usually ignored is in the name of that law. The law is the Buy American Act of 1933. So we've learned a little something since 1933, which is we don't want to do 1933 again. Um, economic nationalism was, in my view, the fundamental cause of the Great Depression. It was through the rounds of tariffs in the late uh, after the recession, the economy began to um, decline. It was the trigger that turned the recession of 1930 and 31 into the Great Depression that struck in 32, and it was the thing that prolonged. The Great Depression and prevented the recovery that that otherwise would have been. I mean, it, it is the villain of the story. Um, so when you see that there is a Buy American Act from 1933, that is a clue that Buy American is not good policy. Uh, I mentioned David at the outset that I wanted to um, wrap up with a bit of discussion closer to home. Um, in recent days, we've seen uh, countries like Germany and others uh, recommit to higher levels of defense spending. In effect. Um, pursuing the NATO, the NATO goal of 2% of uh, GDP. Um, viewers and listeners will know that Canada is barely at 1.3%, and there doesn't seem to be much political momentum to change that. How do you yeah. think Canada ought to be responding to these developments? Uh, do we need to be boosting our military spending? Uh, for sure, but it should have happened a long time ago. Uh, one of the problems in a crisis, and this is maybe a, an inevitable problem of government, is security spending is like buying a life insurance policy. Um, the, the premium is not wasted if you don't need it. At the end of every year that you've not used your life insurance, you shouldn't be sad that you wasted your premium on the life insurance. You should be happy. You didn't need your, your loved ones didn't need the life insurance because you're still with us. And next year, you'll pay the premium again, hoping you will not need it. So the reason um, to pay 2% for uh, defense is, yeah, the people say, well, that money is wasted. That's ideally, yes, ideally, uh, ideally every dollar of your defense spending is wasted. That is a good world when it's all wasted because you haven't had to use it because you've been ready for the crisis that uh, the defense spending has helped to deter. But it has been a problem that Canada has such close emotional bonds to Ukraine, so many Canadians of Ukrainian Heritage, so much emotional investment in the country. And yet Canada has not been providing Ukraine with this kind of military assistance um, that other countries have because Canada doesn't have the assistance to give. Um, so you want to be you want to be ready. And the whole the, the thing about security spending is you have to be ready for lots and lots of different kinds of contingencies, many of which will never arise. Um, but I think there, there have been two shocks this year. One is the defenselessness of Ottawa uh, in the face in the face of this prolonged trucker boycott. And I just ask everyone to consider what would have happened if one of those trucks had contained a bomb and how unready Ottawa was for that mercifully um, uh, not, uh, imaginary, um, but very plausible um, threat. Uh, and in the same way that Canada, I mean, doesn't have to worry about um, direct invasions of its territory because it's under the U.S. security umbrella. But if Canada wants to be a participant and to help friends, uh, and to have and, and to have its voice be heard, you know, pr uh, President Macron, uh, in his important speech, I think just yesterday, you were the day before you and I are speaking, paid tribute to the Canadian role, but he was paying tribute, I think, to Canada's intentions and words, and to Canada, and Canada has provided generous economic assistance to Ukraine, but as a military partner, Canada hasn't been helpful, and it won't be helpful the next time unless it builds up its capabilities, and that means having things in inventory that you hope you'll never have to use. Um, you mentioned um, the, the kind of moral hazard uh, explanation for why we don't see more um, public investment in um, defense and security capacities. Another explanation, it seems to me, 
is a growing tendency in Canadian politics for federal politicians to spend a lot of time focused on provincial and municipal issues like health care, child care yeah. and housing. Um, how do you think we can restore our federal politics to focus on the levers of national power? Yeah. Um, well, there's a, a saying that many of us who have had teenagers um, uh, repeat to our children, um, and that is, um, you know, what what is the distinguishing feature of of adulthood? We hope, and that is, uh, and that's good judgment. And where does good judgment come from? It comes from experience. And where does experience come from? It comes from bad judgment. So, <laughs> there may be, like, why do the post-war generations look so wise to us in retrospect, look wiser to us than we often look to ourselves? Because they went through some terrible experiences and they learned hmm. some very hard-won wisdom. Um, they learned it about the importance of free trade. They learned it about the importance of collective security. Um, they learned about the importance of moderate politics at home and avoiding extremist ideology. They learned that totalitarianism can appear in many different forms and from many different directions. It's, it can be both. It can be it can be fascist. It can be socialist. Um, the, 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 that the threat is totalitarianism as such, and no excuses for any vector of totalitarianism. Well, in in that same way, I think out of um, this horrifying disaster in Europe. And look, if we were better people. If we were wider in our sympathies, we might have learned these lessons from the wars that took place elsewhere. I and mean, one of the questions people are asking now is, well, the Russians did these same things in Syria in 2015. They did them in Chechnya uh, in 1999. Why weren't you shocked then? And uh, it is a human fallibility that we are, our, our feelings are more engaged and we feel more identity. And maybe we should learn to feel more identity with all kinds of human beings and not just those who, you know, uh, whose ancestors populated our, our prairies. But that's the way human beings are. Um, can, there is a strong emotional identification with Ukraine. And let's learn some wisdom from this. And let's make sure that now, out of this terrible experience, comes a 21st century that is recommitted to free trade, in, uh, international cooperation, collective security, and the ideals of democracy. It seems to me, David, that's a, a great way to wrap up um, today's session of uh, From Dialogues. Thank you for, for joining me. Uh, on behalf of the team at The Hub and our, our listeners and Thank viewers. You. And uh, we'll definitely have a lot to catch up on in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Sean.